Inside the Illini Big Ten College Football is brought to you by your local Anheuser-Busch distributors. Ray Eldridge Jewelry, elegance without the attitude. Peoria and Decatur, Physicians Choice Wellness, give away your weight today. And Buffalo Wild Wings, Matu, Champagne Savoy. Hey folks, welcome to Inside the Illini Big Ten College Football, the show that each week will do just that. Take you inside the game, the practices, interview rooms, and minds of players and coaches as we get ready for this week's Fighting Illini game. Hey folks, I'm Matt Loveless. We're here at Buffalo Wild Wings in Savoy as we are every week for a football show for Illinois football fans. We'll preview the upcoming game from every possible angle. And after a tough loss last week, the Illini are all set for a big game against an FCS school, the Charleston Southern Buccaneers. Now, as usual, I'll defer the expertise to our panel. We have Steve Kelly from WDWS Radio, Brian Barnhart, the voice of the Illini, and in for his third week of a relief appearance, Lauren Tate, columnist for the Champaign News Gazette. We appreciate having him here. We'll toss it over to the table, guys. Well, thanks, Matt. And guys, I don't know if you can, uh, how far you have to go back to find a worst week in the Big Ten than they had last week. Uh, the Big Ten going 6-6, 0-3 and six, oh and three on the West Coast. Uh, we were watching those games uh, throughout the day out in uh, Arizona, Brian, and uh, it just kept getting worse and worse. Well, you know, and based on the results from the previous year, when these were kind of the rematches of some of the games from a year ago, I think Wisconsin, Oregon State, Wisconsin beat them badly uh, in Camp Randall. They go out there and what score seven points and struggle, fire their offensive line coach. Uh, you've got Illinois, who beat Arizona State the, the year before, go out and lose, and Nebraska, uh, you know, gets beat by UCLA. So, yeah, not a good week in that regard, even just for those three teams and then some others as well. Well, I got depressed just watching Iowa try to score against Iowa State. They did get a couple field goals, and Wisconsin was the same thing. They didn't break the uh, shutout until the last two minutes. It was just kind of a pathetic showing and, and one that uh, really get, should give Illinois hope in the sense that uh, it isn't impossible to win their division, but Illinois didn't play well either. Yeah, when you, look at the, you mentioned the Iowa game. They're playing at home, and they can't get a touchdown on the board. That was surprising. and. Uh, uh, a six and six uh, finish after a ten and two start. We knew the ten and two start was probably not going to stand up every week in non-conference play, but nobody thought six and six. Penn State goes out and just thoroughly overwhelms Virginia and loses the game. Missed four field goals that were really makeable. Missed an extra point, had it blocked, and had the ball down in their territory, in Virginia territory, nine times and just can't get any points out of it. It was ridiculous, but it seems like everything's working against uh, Penn State this year. Right now, when you look at it, because Ohio State has played well, but they're not obviously eligible for postseason, the team that's playing the best of anybody, most consistent, is Michigan State. And they uh, rolled again in their last game. Well, I will tell you a team that played pretty well and lost, and that's Purdue. They gave Notre Dame all they could handle. Notre Dame kicked a field goal with less than 10 seconds to go in the game to win it, break the tie. Purdue's, I think, going to be pretty rugged in, in the conference. They did lose a quarterback, however, not their starter, but a guy that was going to play a lot. Yeah, Robert Marv went down, and uh, he's, a, he's been a guy that's had injury issues over the course of his career. Danny Hope is saying they think they might get him back late in the season, but uh, that would be a tough one there. It would be, but I guess the big news that happened during the week had to do with Notre Dame. A lot of teams, uh, a lot of people from the Big Ten are always kind of hoping they would come in, and, of course, the invitation was there a few years ago, but now I guess they're going to the ACC. Football drives the bus, and uh, we've said that a long uh, time, and it's certainly true in that case. It really does, and, and basically this is a football decision because they don't want to go into a conference, but they'd be better off in the Big Ten for their, all their other sports. But football's, uh, Big Ten's not going to accept them without football, so they're going to go to ACC. They'll still play Purdue, Michigan, and Michigan State, I assume. We're off and rolling. Plenty to talk about, but we'll throw it back to you, Matt. Hey, thank you, Steve. Like you said, a lot of topics from the last week, and we'll actually get to what happened on both sides of the Big Ten a little bit later in the show. But coming up next, we have to talk about last week's game a little bit. All phases of the game, and surprisingly, especially on defense, the Illini were just dominated out west. We'll try to dissect the game, figure out what went wrong next on Inside the Illini, Big Ten College Football. Hey, welcome back to Inside the Illini Big Ten College Football. Matt Loveless here at Buffalo Wild Wings in Savoy. Now we want to thank our local Anheuser-Busch distributor, Gagney Distributing. Each week they'll help us send a lucky fan or two to the 
Illini game this week playing Charleston Southern. Now you have to be here at Buffalo Wild Wings in Savoy for our taping of the show. That's Wednesdays at noon. We'll announce the winner coming up later in the program. Like I said, two tickets, your chance to make it to a game. Now we have to move on to the Arizona State game. Now we knew it would be a tough task in the desert. It was a late game. In fact, it didn't end until almost one o'clock central time. But on paper, the Sun Devils and Illini were actually pretty evenly matched. And of course, when that played out on turf, not exactly what happened as we recap the action in Tempe. The Fighting Illini arrived at Sun Devil Stadium off a feel-good win, but a discouraging injury to their quarterback. Nathan Shieldhouse didn't start. In fact, he didn't play, and in the end, it didn't matter. We did not play well on any side of the football. First quarter, ASU sophomore QB Taylor Kelly in his first start against an FBS team hits Kevin Osier for the five-yard touchdown. Halfway through the first, the Sun Devils took a lead. Minutes later, they were back at the Illinois one, and Cameron Marshall punched in another score. It was 14-0 after a quarter, but it seemed like the blink of an eye. They were doing what they needed to do to be successful, and of course they were. Early in the second, though, a sign of life and a promising one at that. Donovan Young getting to the outside, breaking tackles, a 17-yard touchdown run, part of a 231-yard rushing attack from the Illini. It was a ball game again. It was definitely a confidence boost for the backs, you know. And uh, we should be even better from going over this week. But the defensive breakdowns, especially in the red zone, killed the Illini before the half. Sun Devil freshman QB Michael Eubank in attempted just five passes, but here are two of them. The Illini secondary not even looking at Chris Coyle. An easy touchdown to put ASU back up by 14. Then two and a half minutes later, Eubank to Coyle again. Sun Devils up 28-7. We didn't have everybody on the same page early in that game. We didn't communicate to the coaches what was going on on the field or whatever because they thought something else was happening. It was just a lot of communication breakdown. The Illini got the chance to make it respectable at the half. Miles Osei, who had four completions on the day, also threw two to ASU linebacker Carlos Mendoza. Mendoza's second pick put the Sun Devils in the locker room up 21. I thought Miles did some things too with his feet, made some unforced errors. Just the second play out of the half, Riley O'Toole back in at quarterback, and he's picked off. Allen Darby returns it to the Illini 13. The wind was out of their sails. Arizona State added two more touchdowns and a field goal. 45-14, the final. The three turnovers is what you think about, and uh, you know, us. Uh, definitely things that we can do and be successful. The Illini got an overnight plane ride from Phoenix back to Champaign. You think it over. We need to stop the pass. We did not stop the pass. That was the uh, worst game ever. We got to pick up blitzes. It was all feeling pretty, pretty, pretty bad about. It. We've got to consistently move the football. And this shouldn't happen again. Well, of course, the Illini made the uh, long trek out there to the desert, as you just saw, to uh, lose to Arizona State. And, uh, Steve, you were up with me on the radio broadcast. Uh, that game was over pretty early. I mean, Arizona State uh, pretty much dominated from start to finish. Well, they move right down the uh, field on the first drive, 68 yards on that drive, only to fumble at the one. You thought, well, okay, maybe there's a break, but they continued to, to move down the field. It was 28-7 to at halftime. I had John McEvick on at halftime, the former Illini coach. He said, got him right where we want him. <laughs> Didn't turn out quite that way. Well, I did. I noticed that John McEvick said they're pass first team. Well, they were, and Illinois was not a pass first defense because they weren't guarding the receivers and they were just too open. I thought there was some confusion in the beginning and they talk about communication from the sideline to the field. The plays were coming fast, hot and heavy, and the Illini were having problems getting together organized. I think defense is a lot of organization and they just didn't have it in this game. I think the quickness of the game and the confusion early really had them uh, upset. And it was interesting because uh, the Illini came in, uh, they held Western Michigan to minus six rushing yards. Western Michigan went on to score over 50 uh, in their ball game, so you could tell the Illinois did a good job against them, but I don't know if it was communication or whatever, but so many of us were worried about the offense going into that ball game, and it turned out the defense struggled, and then the offense, of course, without the quarterback, uh, Shieldhouse at the start uh, struggled as well. I think we were all concerned about the speed of the game, and I was thinking more on the field, not prior to the snap, but it turned to be the prior to the snap uh, effect that uh, the way how quickly they ran that offense that got um, Illinois confused and then into that miscommunication that you talked about. It had to be something that way because physically Illinois is okay. I mean, defensively I'm speaking, 
Uh, but there's something that happens to Illinois when they take the road in a non-conference game. And I've looked it up, and since 1966, when I came here, uh, they've played 52 games on the road in non-conference and lost 41 of them, and most of them have been semi-lopsided. So there's something about going on the road that Illinois is just not responding to and never have. Bright spot for the Illini, though, was Josh Ferguson, over 100 yards. Yeah. Uh, you know, some of that he may have done on his own. Maybe he uh, you know, was able to break loose when if the blocking wasn't there, but many times it was, and uh, he took advantage of the opportunity coming back from the hamstring from a year ago. You know, think Donovan Young had a good game. He had 65 yards. They rushed the ball for 231 yards. You'd like to look at that as a bright spot. Maybe it is to some extent, but a lot of that came when the game was pretty much decided. Well, well I think Illinois has got a They've got to go back to the run game because the passing game vertically, they're just not, they're, there's no intermediate or vertical passing game so far. And I think you'll see that uh, in the game against Charleston Southern. They've got, to, they've got to run the football. Had the entry to Darius Malines along the way, too. Steve Hall got banged up in that ball game. We'll see what their uh, status is uh, for the ball game uh, this morning against Charleston Southern. But obviously, an important game for Illinois to try to bounce back. And we'll talk about more about that against the Buccaneers in just a little bit. But let's go back to Matt for right now. Thanks, Brian. We'll dissect that leader's division coming up next, where even Illinois' 31-point loss may not have been the most memorable disappointment in Week 2. That's pretty sad. We'll go there next on Inside the Illini Big Ten College Football. The Inside the Illini Weekly MVP is brought to you by Shields. Gear, passion, sports. Win or lose, we'll pick the top player or players from each week's Fighting Illini game. And coming out of one that was less than impressive for Illinois, there was a part of their game that was much better, the running game. Our co-MVPs are Donovan Young and Josh Ferguson, combining for 166 yards. Young added this touchdown score. The entire rushing attack gained 231 yards Saturday. A big improvement over week one. Hey, welcome back. Well, for the second week in a row, it wasn't exactly a banner week for the Big Ten. Talking leaders division right now, Illinois' loss was just one of a handful of disappointments across the country. In fact, one could argue that the best performance from the division came from the team that lost to Notre Dame at Notre Dame. WAND's Eric Harold gives us a look at the week in the leaders. Leaders division, Urban Meyer and the Ohio State Buckeyes looking to improve to 2-0 against Central Florida. First quarter, Braxton Miller takes it off the middle, plenty of blockers, nothing but pay dirt in front of him. 37-yard touchdown run, Ohio State up 7-0 early. It's a red Wookiee, in case you're wondering. Third quarter, Braxton Miller rolls left, looks for running room, takes it off the field. Six-yard touchdown run, 17-10, Ohio State, more Miller. Eight-yard touchdown run, his third of the day, Ohio State rolls over Central Florida. Penn State, Bill O'Brien looking for their first win of the season at Virginia. Quarterback Matthew McGloin drops back, throws it to Kyle Carter, eight-yard touchdown, 7-0 Penn State. They lead early. Third quarter, Michael Rocco, play action, passes it to Jeremiah Mathis, 10-7 Virginia. They lead, but Penn State comes back. McGloin throws it up to Allen Robinson, lays out for the catch, 13-10 Penn State. They lead late, but Virginia, they would come back. Rocco passes to Jake McGee, go-ahead touchdown, Virginia. Wins this one 17 to 16. Brett Bielema's Wisconsin Badgers, 13th in the country at Oregon State. Third quarter, Sean Mannion throws it. 20 yards, a strike to Brandon Cooks, 7-3 Oregon State. With less than two minutes left, Daniel Bryan passes it to tight end Jacob Peterson. 10-7 Oregon State, they pull within three, but it would not be enough. Oregon State upsets Wisconsin. In South Bend, the Boilermakers taking on number 22, Notre Dame. Everett Golson, touchdown run just inside the pylon, 7-0 Notre Dame early. Purdue's Robert Marva would respond. Drops back, passes it to Antavian Edison, touchdown, knots it up in the second quarter. It would be knotted up late, but that would end with this field goal. Kyle Brinza, game winner, 20-17 Notre Dame, one last leader's division score, Indiana. They rout Massachusetts 45-6. The Hoosiers, they improved to 2-0 on the season. We're talking about teams in the leaders division of the Big Ten. Only two victorious teams in the division uh, last week in non-conference play. Ohio State won to go to 2-0 guys and Indiana 
uh, also went to 2-0 with their win. We talked earlier about Purdue uh, being maybe the most impressive team in the division in that three-point loss to uh, Notre Dame. Yeah, they did battle uh, Notre Dame. I uh, didn't know what to expect, uh, you know, but it seems like Purdue and Notre Dame down through the recent years have played some really close games at times when Purdue's been good and Notre Dame average and vice versa. And uh, I kind of thought Notre Dame might win uh, by a couple of touchdowns. As it turned out, uh, Purdue was with them all the way. Brian, how much trouble is Wisconsin in? They've had two of mediocre performances, and offensively, this isn't even close to them. Here, you got a, name, a guy named Ball that should lead the nation. He's a Heisman candidate. He should maybe lead the nation in rushing, and he, he couldn't get out of his own track Saturday. Yeah, I don't know if you've, yeah, you've seen a line coach fired after, after two like games. That. I mean, and Wisconsin has been known, obviously, for their successful running game, and, and they haven't been able to get that going. I know Monte Ball was talking about that, and, and then just... Um, just being, you know, they've been such a prolific offense even the last couple of years uh, when Russell Wilson was there and so forth and, and nothing. On the bright side of Wisconsin's apparent troubles should be happiness for other teams in the division. Illinois, even though they're coming off an embarrassing loss, you still got to beat Wisconsin if you're going to win that division, and uh, maybe it's uh, not out of the question. Well, Illinois has to go to Camp Randall to win that game, but I wonder, it, it appears to me that there's a big drop off from Wilson to O'Brien at quarterback. It appears there's a big drop off in the offensive line, and they just simply aren't moving the ball in any fashion. I don't know. I, I mean, they should be able to handle Oregon State anywhere, but they didn't do it. And I'm just uh, I'm starting to think maybe Purdue is a team to watch in the division because Ohio State and Penn State are ineligible. And, of course, Indiana's already doubled their win total from a year ago, and they're playing a little better defense. I mean, not that they've beaten great competition, but they've got to improve step by step. You know, under Kevin Wilson, and that's one way they had to improve because I think they gave up 30 or more points like eight times last year. Yeah, Roberson's uh, broken leg really sets him back. I remember when uh, they talked about it before the season, and they said Roberson has to be great. Well, he can't be great anymore because he's not going to be there. Yeah, he's the quarterback went down with a broken leg. They play Ball State uh, tonight, uh, today, and that that's a game that Ball State has won the last couple of times they've played. But Indiana has a pretty good shot at being three and zero. Oh. I think that, that, that doesn't prove anything yet about Indiana. I mean, it's too early. At least they're playing up to their expectations, but uh, I'm not sure that they'll be a contender in that con in, in the division. I'm not really talking about Ohio State, although the, they're, uh, they're probably the best team in the division. Well, they are. I don't think there's any doubt about it. They're the best team in the division, and they've shown that. But not being eligible, uh, that changes everything. And you don't have to beat Ohio State in order to, win, uh, to get in the championship game. That's a look at the leaders division. Matt, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Let's move on to the Legends Division, where yet another ranked Big Ten team lost over in Pac-12 country. We'll dissect that coming up on Inside the Illini Big Ten College Football. The Inside the Illini Play of the Week is brought to you by your local Anheuser-Busch distributor, Gagney Distributing. It's a top play from last week's Illini game. Mike had helped Illinois ice a game in week one. It helped Arizona State do the same against the Orange and Blue. Sun Devil safety Alden Darby, the leaping pick and the big return. Look at the interception again, a backbreaker for the Illini, but an impressive grab in our play of the week. Hey folks, welcome back to Inside the Illini here at Buffalo Wild Wings in Savoy. Time to talk Legends Division where it's like a mirror image of the leaders, except for a little bit better record, but a big loss out west. We go back to Eric Harold for the highlights from week two. Legends Division in Ann Arbor, number 19, Michigan, taking on Air Force, hoping to avenge a loss to Alabama last week, and this play would help their cause. Denard Robinson, up the middle, takes it all the way to the end zone on their second play from scrimmage, 79 yards, Michigan, up early. Air Force would not go quietly. Fourth quarter, Cody gets. Eight yard run, and the two point conversion would bring them within three points. Michigan, 28 25. Later, fourth down, Michigan shuts them down. Michigan escapes with a win, 31 25. In state game between Michigan State, 11th in the country, and Central Michigan. Second quarter, Le'Veon Bell to the outside, cuts it upfield. That is six points. Michigan State, 14 0 in the second quarter. Third quarter, Andrew Maxwell. Easy pass to Benny Fowler, seven yard touchdown, puts them up 31-0. Michigan State cruises 41-7. What about Nebraska, 16th in the country at UCLA and 
This is something that Nebraska wants to see all year long. A long touchdown run by Taylor Martinez. 92 yards, the quarterback calling his own number. Huskers up 14-7. But all the wheels in the world will not help you if you get shellacked like this in the end zone. Safety puts UCLA up by two, and they would win this one 36-30. In other Legends Division scores, Northwestern tops Vandy 23-13. Minnesota demolished New Hampshire 44-7, and Iowa State held on to the Cyhawk Trophy for another year, defeating Iowa 9-6. Well, three teams in the uh, Legends Division still undefeated. One of those, Michigan State. They've been a big story early this year, guys, as far as a team that potentially could be in that BCS running if they can continue to play the way they have been. And the other story of the uh, Legends so far is that Iowa cannot put the ball in the end zone. As far as Michigan State goes, isn't it interesting that they may be the only team, probably are the only team, still in that BCS discussion in the Big Ten. They're, they've got a chance to, to stay that way with a game against Notre Dame. That won't be an easy game, but it's not uh, usual that this time in the season, Lauren, we're talking about so many teams being out of the well, national championship. You wouldn't expect after two weeks that you'd eliminate 11 out of the 12 schools in the Big Ten, but basically... That's about where it stands right now. That doesn't mean somebody can't rise up. But, and maybe one loss at the very beginning of a season doesn't have that much impact on the end of the season. But Michigan State is the one team. If they lose that game to Notre Dame, I'd say the Big Ten is out of the picture. And that's awfully early to be out of the picture. Any thoughts on what's wrong with Iowa? I didn't get a chance to see much of the game. Obviously, they've got some, some offensive issues as far as moving the ball and getting it into the end zone scoring only field goals against uh, their arch rival Iowa State. I've seen some slippage on, on them offensively over time. I, I just think that they can be in a lot of games defensively. They're pretty good defensively. And, and they'll battle you. But I don't know that they're, they're not very prolific with their offense. And, and I think it's starting to be a drag on them. And I think that's what happened against Iowa State. Iowa State comes in there and just shuts them down. And, of course, you look at the numbers, Iowa 112th in total offense, 111th in scoring. They've scored one touchdown, 102nd in rushing. They've had injuries in years past to running backs. That has been a factor. Northwestern kind of quietly 2-0 and so far, too. A, a road win, uh, Syracuse. They beat Vanderbilt. Now they play Boston College. I think Minnesota is an interesting team so far. They're 2-0 and as well. We'll learn more about them this week. They play Western Michigan in Minneapolis. And uh, Minnesota is a team that... Uh, Coached, of course, by Jerry Kill. He's got the reputation of getting teams turned around pretty quickly. Western Michigan might have their passing game going by this week, and it certainly looked like it last week, not against Illinois. But Carter's a good thrower, and, and uh, I, he, he could be a threat to Minnesota. Minnesota, about the time you start to be, have a little confidence in them, that's when they have a bad game. So I, I'm not sure how that's going to turn out. I, I would think Minnesota would win at home, but still, they better be ready for a lot of passes. We mentioned Northwestern starting 2-0. and They did that last year and then wound up losing five in a row. They did finish somewhat strong at the end. And then, of course, we mentioned earlier, Nebraska losing at UCLA. That did surprise me. Just based on UCLA was a very average team last year. Yeah, I thought uh, the Big Ten would uh, win two of those three games out west. I really didn't think Illinois would come away with that win, but I thought UCLA would uh, go down to Nebraska, and I thought Wisconsin would beat Oregon State. Didn't happen, and, and uh, I think we know our place now. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, pretty much it as far as the Legends division goes. Again, we'll keep an eye on that as we go along, and let's go back to Matt for more. Hey, thanks a lot. Coming up, we've got our first in-season segment of Illini in the Pros. A few made an impact in week one. We'll go there next on Inside the Illini. Our Gem of the Week is brought to you by Ray Eldridge Jewelry. Elegance without the attitude in Peoria and Decatur. This one from the South Carolina, East Carolina game. An incredible play. Gamecocks QB Dylan Thompson takes a snap. Nearly sacked. He escapes. Rushed again, but hits wide receiver D.L. Moore across the middle, who jukes two defenders, gets a block, cuts to his left, and takes it in. The play lasted 14 seconds, a long time for a 29-yard touchdown. It's our gem of the week. Welcome back to Inside the Illini here at Buffalo Wild Wings in Savoy. Now, time for our weekly installment of Illini in the Pros. Now, from what I saw, a lot of catches, a handful of yards and some tackles, plenty of face time for former alums on week one. Our Noah Newman gives us a look at what they did in the first week of the NFL season. 
Hey, good morning, Matt. Week one was a big one for many Illini and the pros. Let's take a look back at some of the memorable moments from last Sunday, and we'll start in New Orleans, where second-year pro Martez Wilson made a huge play on special teams, bursting through the line, blocking this Redskins punt, resulting in a touchdown for the Saints. Unfortunately for Tez, his team was victim number one for RG3, losing 40-32. to In Nashville, rookie Tavon Wilson snagged his first career interception, and Tom Brady did the rest for the Patriots, throwing for 236 yards, 69 of which were to former Illini Brandon Lloyd. Lloyd and company host Arizona in week two. Former Illini thinks it will be a tough matchup. These guys are guys who individually get a lot of respect around the league. And now that um, uh, the philosophy is starting to be um, uh, well executed amongst the players, they're, they're a good team. Cutler going deep for Jeffrey. Enzo, got it! What was a rocky debut for Vontae Davis in Chicago? Davis and the Colts secondary were torched by Jay Cutler for 333 yards. His coach Chuck Pagano knows that's something they need to fix. You know, the thing that we got to get short up and, and short up quickly is because once you open up a can of worms and you show a weakness, you know, people are going to attack you until you get the, you know, put the fire out. So the Colts will look to bounce back against the Vikings in their home opener. That's a look at this week's Illini and the Pros. Back to you guys in Savoy. There are 22 former Illini on the NFL rosters. Not all saw action, but a majority of them did. I think the most impressive performance was probably turned in by Brandon Lloyd. Five catches, 69 yards for his new team, Brian, the uh, New England Patriots. Continues to kind of amaze me, and I know Lawrence talked about it, how, how many years ago he played at Illinois now, and then he seemed to do really well, and then he kind of didn't really show up much, and then here he is back at the end of his career, maybe playing as well as he ever has. The injuries kind of set him back at one point, but I don't think there's any doubt not in my mind that Brandon Lloyd is the greatest receiver in Illinois history. And they didn't catch the most balls, but if you remember when um, David Williams, who caught 101, went to the NFL, he couldn't get off the line of scrimmage. He, he just wasn't, uh, he wasn't strong enough. Lloyd is tough. He can get out there, he's smart, and he's, he's like a cat on those long passes, and he reacts to him like Jim Edmonds on a fly ball at center field. I mean, he just, he can, he can control his body, and get those, and I just think that uh, Lloyd is going to have a great season for New England. He's ideal there. You know, Kurt Kittner, our radio colleague, mentions, uh, of course, he played with uh, Brandon. He said he was the best he ever saw or played with. That when you just put the ball in the vicinity, you knew he was going to catch it. And that's Brandon Lloyd, uh, as you guys know, came in as a defensive back, yeah, he stepped off a curve and hurt his ankle, and went on the offensive side of the ball. He wasn't on defense very long. No, <laughs> But uh, you got a couple guys that are going to be good later on, uh, LaShore and, and I think Mendenhall. But uh, both Detroit and Pittsburgh will be very careful when they come back, which will be some weeks now. They're going to be very careful with them after those injuries. Yeah, that's a look at the, some of the fighting Illini in the NFL. We'll do that every week. Right now, it's back to you, Matt. Hey, thanks a lot, Steve. Talking NFL there, talking college football again. Another Illinois team was taking on Western Michigan. Eastern was up in Kalamazoo, and EIU takes us there next when we go Inside the Panthers on Inside the Illini. Hey folks, welcome back to Inside the Illini here at Buffalo Wild Wings in Savoy. We're almost a kickoff of that Illini game, but a lot to get to still. Despite a loss to a talented Western Michigan team, Eastern Illinois remains in that coveted others receiving votes category of the FCS national rankings. A little improvement under the first year of the Dino Babers era. We go inside the Panthers with Eastern Illinois University. After lighting up O'Brien Field in week one against Southern Illinois, Eastern Illinois faced its first road test of 2012 at an FBS school in Western Michigan and the Panthers experienced some fireworks in the first quarter. Walker the ball carrier, touchdown for the Panthers. I thought that uh, Eric Laura uh, obviously had a good game and an exceptional first half. And, and really came out to compete. Uh, Chris Wright made some plays. Uh, but overall, I thought that uh, as a group, that, that was uh, 
that was an average to below average game for us. Chris Wright's spectacular catch late in the first quarter tied the game, but Western Michigan showed off their offensive skills in the second quarter as they tallied four touchdowns, propelling them to a 52-21 victory over EIU. I think our team fought. I thought we fought real hard. We fought, he, even though the scoreboard didn't show, I think we played with a lot of heart and enthusiasm. They were running some different defenses in the second half and uh, second uh, middle of the second quarter. They manned me up pretty much the whole game. Uh, you know, we just weren't successful on the offensive and defensive side of the ball. But you know, we've we've put some measures in to to not let that happen with ISU, and uh, we're we're gonna you know do some damage on offense. EAU's up-tempo offense rang up over 300 yards total, a far cry from their total offensive output of over 500 yards against SIU. The Panther defense had a far different game from week one as well, facing a veteran quarterback at an FBS school. The Panther D gave up over 600 yards to the Broncos. I thought the team came out and played extremely well in the uh, first quarter offensively and uh, really gave us a chance. And then obviously the second quarter, uh, that, got, that game got away from us and, and, and it happened pretty quickly, which was uh, disappointing because I thought we were ready to give uh, a better effort, have a better showing. This week, EIU stays on the road, but just up the road in normal as the Panthers and the Redbirds of Illinois State renew their rivalry, the 101st edition of the Mid-America Classic. EIU head coach Dino Babers will be opposite a familiar face in Redbird head coach Brock Speck. Babers and Speck have been assistant coaches together twice in their careers, one of them being on Bob Scoo's first staff at EIU in 1987. A good friend of mine, I've known him a long time. When I was coaching the running backs back here in uh, 1987, he was coaching the, uh, the inside linebackers. So really, we went against each other every day. And uh, the things that he used to say to his players about my running backs and the things I used to say about his linebackers to my running backs, I mean, with both of us both standing there, used to make our, make our mouths drop a little bit. But a super competitor, uh, a fabulous coach, and uh, no doubt we're going to have our hands full with the Redbirds. ISU is off to a 2-0 start, winning last week at an FBS school, Eastern Michigan. The Redbirds will counter the Panthers' up-tempo offense with a ground-and-pound attack. This is a rivalry game, but it's a non-conference game. And we're, we want to win the football game because it's a rivalry. They do, they do as well, but we also want to get ready for the OVC. Uh, we're not going to change what we do, and we do what we do, and uh, we're going to try to go, get out there and, and play at an up-tempo and, and uh, get first downs, and hopefully first downs lead to touchdowns, and then hand them the ball, and if they want to take their time with the ball, that's their right. Last year in Charleston, EIU won the centennial matchup in the series, 33-26, hoisting the trophy in Bob Spoo's final time against ISU. A road team has not won in this long-standing rivalry since 2008, when EIU won in normal. This will be the Panthers' final tune-up before they open up conference play in the OVC next week. Kickoff is set for 1 o'clock at Hancock Stadium in Normal. Reporting on the Eastern Illinois Panthers for Inside the Illini, I'm Ryan Snodgrass of WEIU-TV. Hey, up next, we'll look into Week 3 for our pick segment. We'll dissect some of the big matchups. Plus, we go to Facebook to answer your questions about Illini football. Somebody wins a $25 Buffalo Wild Wings gift card. That's next on Inside the Illini. Hey folks, welcome back to Inside the Illini. Time for our pick segment. Each week we'll be making picks about some of the bigger games, some of the closer games around college football. We'll keep track of those. And this is our, called our Physicians Choice Wellness Healthy Choice Pick'em Giveaway Your Weight Today. Now, we'll take a look at the standings really quick. Uh, I'm 2-0. and I was correct on my Georgia pick over Mizzou, a big win for the Bulldogs there. Brian, you had Nebraska over UCLA, one of those upsets. Uh, uh, Steve, Notre Dame beating Purdue, redeeming yourself after your Penn State pick. And then Lauren, I got to bring it up. You picked the Illini what was I thinking? to beat Arizona State. <laughs> I never learned. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So uh, a tough loss for them there. But we'll start with our picks. I have Michigan State and Notre Dame, uh, a big matchup there. A close one as well, this one at Michigan State. And we saw Notre Dame last week. I was less than impressed with them with what they did over Purdue. They obviously brought in, brought in Tommy Reese to, to kind of close things up for him. And it worked, let him on a game-winning drive. But Michigan State, you look at the weapons they have. Andrew Maxwell wondered how he would replace Kirk Cousins. He's done that just fine especially over at Boise State uh, in week one. And then Le'Veon Bell, that guy has emerged as a Heisman contender just in a couple of weeks. Hardly anybody knew who he was outside of Big Ten country. And so I'm picking Michigan State. I just think they're a little bit better in every phase of the game. I'm going to step out of the Big Ten and into the SEC. 
don't know much about uh, the SEC or ask much about the SEC. I'm going with the Florida at Tennessee game. This is a game that uh, Florida has won the last two years by 10 points. Tennessee's kind of on the comeback. They're both in the top 25. I think Florida has too much overall. I'm going with uh, the Gators over the Volunteers down in Knoxville. Going with the uh, Pac-12 for my pick again. Uh, didn't have any luck out there last week <laughs> with that, but uh, Stanford and USC, this has been a dandy the last uh, couple of years, guys. Uh, well, in 2011, Stanford won 56-48, triple overtime. They won in 2010, 37-35. Last second field goal, 55-21 uh, three years ago. Went for two when they were up big. That caused a little stir at that point, if you remember that. This has been a wild game. I think USC, they did finally put away Syracuse. I think they had the weather delay and all of that at the Jet Stadium. And uh, they've got two of the best receivers in the country. And uh, with Stanford, I guess it's pretty simple. Uh, no luck, no win. So I'll take uh, USC to win that ball game and what should be another good one. I bet. I'll come, I'll come back to the Big Ten and I'll, I'll go to Penn State because we play those guys in two weeks and I'm kind of interested in how they're developing. They had, they've got four really tough games in the preseason. They lost to Ohio and uh, lost again this last week. Uh, really tough game at Virginia. Now they've got uh, Navy coming in and then they got Temple. And Temple was a terrific game last year, if you remember. So I'm going to I'm going to pick uh, Penn State to bounce back. I think they'll come in at two and two against Illinois. I'll pick them in the next two weeks. How's that? Oh, you're predicting two weeks ahead. You might want to wait until <laughs> the day ends. You got to learn your lesson. I thought you said that. All right. I hope Bob will be Bob back. Will be yeah, there you go. <laughs> he can eat that. Thing. He'll be responsible. All right. Hey, right here is where we like to get you the fan involved. We go to Facebook and we ask you guys questions. What do you want to know about Illinois football? The winner here gets a $25 gift card. This week, our question comes from Sam Johnson. A simple question. He asked, who will be our most dangerous offensive weapon? So, Steve, we'll start with you. Who do you think? It depends on whether Nathan Schuhaus plays in the <laughs> exactly. game or not, uh, whether or not uh, they hold him out for a second straight week. But he would be the guy. If he doesn't play, you know, maybe a guy like Josh Ferguson might uh, step up for that role. Ferguson has been the guy early on. He had a great spring. He's carried it over. He had over 100 yards rushing. Um, you know, Shield House is a factor. Um, I still think one of these young receivers, uh, Hardy, uh, Kenny Knight, one of those guys may emerge over time. Right. But right now, that's a position they're concerned about, and they've got to get some production. Right. Well, I have to go with Shield House, but I will say this. I think that the coaching staff will be very careful on the amount of runs that they give him, mm -hmm. and they'll ask him to try to get it done with, with the passes and, and with the play of uh, Young and, and Ferguson in the backfield. And I think, like I said, Young and Ferguson, a couple of great weapons. Uh, another one, John Davis, is a guy who has emerged this year as, as a personal he, where weapon. Where was he Saturday night? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we, we don't know. I guess it changes week to week. Well, we listed off eight or nine names. Sam, we did our best to answer your question. I think we all agree, though, Nate Shieldhouse, if he can be healthy, is going to be the key to most of the offensive performance. In most games this year. Right, absolutely. All right, thank you, Sam. We'll get a hold of you on Facebook to get you that $25 Buffalo Wild Wings gift card. Now, coming up, closing out the show with the uh, with – some talk about Charleston Southern. We'll break down the tape and figure out exactly who this team is and what the Illini has to do today to get a win. That's coming up next on Inside the Illini. Welcome back to Inside the Illini. Wrapping up the show now, taking a look at Charleston Southern. Now let's face it, no coach will ever say anything but glowing reviews of their next opponent, but we have to face facts. This is Illinois' cupcake game, as it were. The FCS's Charleston Southern Buccaneers 0-2 this year. They were 0-11 last year, 14-game losing streak. But it is an important game for a team that needs to fix a few things and get healthy at quarterback. Let's take a look at the matchup. For the first time this season, the Illini will be able to do what Coach Tim Beckman has wanted to do, focus on themselves for 60 minutes. We have got to get better at the things that we can control. No disrespect to their opponent, but Illinois is supposed to win this game by a lot. The Buccaneers are on a current 14-game losing streak, all but two of those against fellow FCS schools. What's really hurt Charleston Southern in the last two football games is their second half. Beckman is right. Last week against Jacksonville, they trailed 3-0 at the break, and lost by a final of 31-10. Junior Malcolm Dixon has been starting at quarterback. His numbers aren't great. Through two games, he's 17-37 for 269 yards with a touchdown and two interceptions. He's also the biggest running threat, again, with some modest numbers. His 50 yards a game leads the team. We are an option football team. You'll see three backs in the backfield. I think at the end of the day, you know, they want to be able to control the ball, you know, run the ball, um, you know, again, with the option. It puts a lot of pressure on you, and 
Uh, you know, they're shifting and doing a lot of movements to try to confuse you. In practice, we've been uh, having our uh, scout team quarterback actually do the option without football, which, um, you know, really makes everybody, you know, um, you have the running back, you take the running back, quarterback, and, you know, so on and so on. So that's one of the things we've been doing, you know, just try to help us make sure that everybody on the defense is doing a job. Really, today will be about regaining a little bit of confidence in the Illini finding their groove on defense and offense again. This week, Beckman was asked if the team would be a bit more conservative on offense considering their opponent. He answered by saying, they haven't earned the right to be that kind of team just yet. We're going to do what we need to do to be successful and help ourselves achieve those things. Well, time to scout Charleston Southern. We'll get to what we know in a little bit, but like I said, it, this game is more of a game trying to figure out exactly what the Illini need to fix, and there were plenty of problems. Talking defense, communication breakdowns, execution breakdowns, everything went wrong on the defensive side of the ball. So what are the key areas that we think they need to fix this well, week? They've got to tackle better. They didn't tackle very well at Arizona State. They get the communication snafu figured out. Whatever that is, that can't happen again. Right. And again, the tackling and the... Uh, Charleston Southern offense is a multiple offense and that option kind of thing, kind of like the, the military academy, so we're going to see some looks they may not see uh, in other games. Well, and then the secondary, you know, uh, Steve Holt just got back, and now he's out again. Uh, you know, Terry Hawthorne was a little dinged up uh, before that game. Uh, just, some, you know, getting those guys healthy and, uh, you know, improving on the, whatever the signal signals being sent in or whatever, get that figured out defensively. Again, they're facing a team, as Steve mentioned, an option style team so uh, you know, they, and, and Charleston Southern has struggled to move the football they've struggled to score so I think if anything get your confidence back and then get ready for a dangerous team in, in La Tech in, in, in a week. Well more so than any game uh, this is an assignment game defensively the assignment is you got to stop the pitch you got to stop the option and in a, you know it's a triple option type thing and, and so each guy on defense ha must do his job. Maybe that was a, a breakdown in, in the game at Arizona State. Obviously, somebody wasn't doing their job in pass coverage. Some of the man-to-man -man coverage broke down. I, I think that I'm, I'm going to be looking at the defensive side more than anything else this week. I think uh, special teams has been okay. There's been, uh, you know, there's been no real breakdowns. Offensively, I don't know what to expect. I think uh, in kind of doing some research as well, if the defense doesn't show up in a big way today, uh, that show some real concerns. They have to execute oh, yeah. on all sides. You look at Malcolm Dixon, who's the quarterback at Charleston Southern, completed less than 50% of his passes, about 230 yards through two games. He leads the team in rushing. He's only got 101 for the season. So, like you said, Steve, not that offense isn't known to push people around very much. The line I need to uh, execute. Yeah, and they averaged less than uh, Charleston Southern. had less than 100 yards a game last year rushing. And they're in the middle of a 14-game losing streak. Now, that doesn't mean their program hasn't been good, because they were. They won 14 in a row at one point right. back between 05 and 09, and were, I think, the winningest team in the Big South. So you know, they've had some success before. But lately on offense, you mentioned Dixon. He's a former receiver. Mm -hmm. They've moved a quarterback. Uh, they just not great offensively and in, in defensively in the second half of games. They've just been blown out 80-24 to 24, uh, in, in overall. In the second half, it's been 63-10. to 10, So they have struggled with both sides of the ball. Back to the Illinois quarterback situation. A lot of talk this week. Do you play Nathan Shieldhouse? Do you hold him out again? Because it's most everybody thinks Illinois can win this game with Lauren Tate at quarterback. I, I'm not sure about that. But do you play Shieldhouse? to get him some reps, to get him ready for a bigger game next week, or do you give him more rest? I'm in the school of playing him, if he's 100% healthy, and getting him back in there. Do you need him the whole game? No, but what do you think? I, I agree with you. I, I think you should play Nathan Shieldhouse this week uh, if he's healthy, and I think he will be. Um, uh, I thought he would be, you know, they did, they did say that he could have gone in the game right. at, at Arizona State. There was no point as the game wore on. I mean, you know, he would have only gone in in an emergency. But I want to see more of those say, guys. I, I know I'm probably alone in this, but I saw some good things except he took him down for a touchdown, made the score 14 to 7. Nice march. Then he throws two straight interceptions. Well, you can't do that, but that's what Shieldhouse did the first time he started. If you go back two years, three. yeah, he threw three. Mm -hmm. And so guys make those kind of mistakes. He's just got to be more conservative. I think Osei's got some ability. He's got a good, strong arm. And he's very versatile. He's holding on the extra points. He's, uh, he can line up a receiver if you need him. He can run the running back kicks and so forth. But I think you know his versatility as a quarterback, when you look at who he was recruited by, Air Force and Navy, we're interested in him as a you know a dual threat quarterback, and uh, he did move the team aside from those two interceptions. 
last week. I thought he moved the team pretty well. I think the odds are we're going to end up seeing all three of them at some point. And I, I would say in terms of Shieldhouse, he needs to get on the field. I know he wants to get on the field. He can't go two weeks without reps entering uh, entering Louisiana Tech, which will be an interesting game as we talk about that more next week. Well, that wraps things up here. Now, before we go, we have to announce our, our ticket winner and a pretty good lunch crowd here at Buffalo Wild Wings in Savoy. Tim McDaniel from Champaign wins our two tickets because he showed up. Wednesdays at noon is when we tape the show. You can win tickets to next week's game. This game starts in just a few minutes, noon at Memorial Stadium, 11 a.m., excuse me, at Memorial Stadium. We will be there. Highlights at 6 and 10 on WAND. Thanks for watching Inside the Illini Big Ten College Football. Inside the Illini Big Ten College Football is brought to you by your local Anheuser-Busch distributors. Ray Eldridge Jewelry, elegance without the attitude. Peoria and Decatur, Physicians Choice Wellness. Give away your weight today. And Buffalo Wild Wings, Mattoon, Champagne, Savoy.